السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وعلى الصفوة الخيرة من أصحابه المؤمنين المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I greet you again my friends, my brothers and sisters and tonight we're going to discuss a specific issue and that is the issue with Fatima alayhi salam the daughter of the Prophet, what happened after the death of her father? Most of the historians believe that she died six months after her father. Some people believe three months. Some people believe 45 days. So within this range, Fatima died. Some historians believe she died at the age of 18. Some historians like Tabari believes that she died at the age of 28. So again, within this range, from 18 to 28 years, very young, what happened? What happened? Because she was not suffering from any illness before the death of her father. She was healthy. But her father told her, you're going to be the first one to join me as the book of Sihah and the book of history tell us. So what happened? Let's focus only on one book and find out how Fatima alayhi salatu wassalam, the noble, the chosen daughter of the Prophet, was treated by the political establishment after the departure of her father, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's go to one book first, and that book is very important. And that book is Sahih al-Bukhari, al-Jami' al-Mukhtasar al-Sahih, al-Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Mughira al-Bukhari, who was born about 183 years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He was born in year 194 Hijri, and died in 256 Hijri. He lived for only 62 years. He was born in the city of Bukhara in today's Uzbekistan. And he died after 62 years in the same country in Uzbekistan, in the city of Samarkand, a village called Khartank, which is outside the city of Samarkand. But then Al-Bukhari, of course, his great-grandfather was Zorastian, and he accepted Islam, converted to Islam in the city of Bukhara at the hand of Al-Yaman Al-Ju'fi, the Wali, the governor of Bukhara at that time. Bukhari, when he was born in Bukhara, his city, moved to uh, to Maru, to Balakh, to Naysabur, and then he came down to Iraq. He lived in Basra, in Baghdad, in Kufa, and then he moved to Hejaz. He went to Mecca, to Medina, Egypt, and then he went to the, to the Levant, to Sham. So he spent a great deal. He said, I spent 16 years of traveling, and his objective was to collect the Hadith collect the hadith from different sources and this is almost almost 220 year uh, 220 years after the death of the prophet peace be upon him and that is the main source of hadith in the school of caliphs and companions the main source of hadith are these six books there is nothing more important than these six books my friends and most of these or all of these in fact were written between 
220 years after the Prophet to almost 300 years after the Prophet. Okay, so he traveled through uh, many cities and he says he met and he interviewed over a thousand Rawi, reporter of Hadith in these many cities. About a dozen cities he traveled to and he lived in and he met more than a thousand and then he took the Hadith from them. Now Tathkiratul Huffad Ibn al Jawzi, another Hadith scholar, tradition scholar in the Sunni school, says Bukhari memorized 100,000, 100,000 authentic Hadith. And he also memorized 200,000 non authentic, unreliable Hadith. Imagine what sort of memory this man had to be able to memorize by heart. Those are Huffaz, memorizers. To memorize 300,000 hadith and reports, 300,000. And then Tariq al-Baghdadi, Tariq Baghdad and Tariq Dimashq, two books of history, uh, reputable books of history narrated by and written by Sunni historians, say that sometimes Bukhari would Hear the hadith, فَرُبَّ حَدِيثٍ سَمِعْتُهُ بِالْبَصْرَةِ كَتَبْتُهُ بالشام. I hear the hadith while I was in Basra. But then I start writing it, documenting it, when I go to Sham. And between Basra and Sham, between the time he was in Basra and the time he went to, to the Levant, to Syria, several months, sometimes several years. But he stores the hadith here in his mind. وَلَرُبَّ حَدِيثٍ سمعته بالشام كتبته بالبصرة. Another hadith I hear it from a reporter in Sham, but I would write it down in Basra. You know myself, when I hear something, I have to write it immediately. After five minutes, if I don't write it, I really forget it completely. Five minutes. Bukhari, Bukhari, this amazing person, he would hear the hadith in one city. And then several years later, he remembers the hadith while he's in another city. This is what he says. And then Bukhari, when he was born, he was Hanafi. Because the people of Bukhara at that time followed the tradition of Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man ibn Thabit. But when he came to Mecca and Medina, Hijaz, most people were Shafi'is, so he converted to the madhab, the tradition of Al Imam al Shafi'i. And then he was the contemporary of Mutawakkil al Abbasi. He lived in Iraq during the time of the Abbasid Empire. And when he was writing, he was during the time of Mutawakkil. And Mutawakkil, I wish some of you go and Google him and see how he treated Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet and see for yourself and discover for yourself his stand, his viciousness against the family of the Prophet. He was the one who demolished the grave of Imam Hussein not only once or twice or three times, seven times. Seven times would demolish the grave of Imam Hussein so people do not go and visit him. This is Al-Mutawakkil who murdered Imam Ali al-Hadi alayhi salam the 10th Imam of the school of Ahlul Bayt. Somehow, somehow, Bukhari, Imam Bukhari tried to please this, this leader, this caliph, the political establishment of that time, because he was a reporter. And he could not gain freedom or even access to those reporters if he does not please the political establishment. So this is now this is how you know that sometimes Bukhari is conservative when he writes about Ahlul Bayt. He's super careful because he wanted to please their opponents. You cannot write. Imagine someone working for President Donald Trump. His staff in, in, in his office in the White House, one of his staffers. And then he writes something in favor now, nowadays, during this pandemic. He writes something in favor of the Chinese president 
or the Iranian president, and he puts it at the desk of the president, what would happen to him? You just tell me. Definitely he will be fired. Bukhari did not want to be fired. He wanted to finish his mission. So he was very careful when it comes to the political establishment. He did not want to provoke their anger. This is why he was super conservative when he speaks about Ali. He only narrates handful of hadiths from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali who was 24 seven with the prophet like a shadow from the age of six until the prophet died. Ali when he was born the prophet carried him on his chest. When the prophet died Ali puts the prophet on his chest according to Tabari. When he was washing the prophet before his burial Ali puts the prophet body on his chest, he was hugging him. This is the relationship between Ali and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bukhari only in his encyclopedia, which has 7,500 hadiths, he narrates only a handful of hadith on behalf of Ali ibn Abi Talib through the Prophet. But when it comes to Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira breaks the record, over 5,000 hadiths. And Abu Huraira was with the Prophet for only one year and seven months, my friends. Not many people know about this. Bukhari says, when I used to collect the hadith, this is what he says in Tariq Baghdad, Tariq Dimashq, Tariq Medina Dimashq, Seer A'lam and Nubala. All these three books are written by Sunni historians. They say on his behalf, Ma adkhaltu fi kitab al -jami'. I would not put anything in this book. إلا ما صح إلا ما صح whatever is authentic وتركت من الصحاح مخافة الطول and many of the hadith that are authentic I did not include them in my book because I did not want to prolong the book because this is مختصر a summary a summary which has 7500 hadith almost and then he says, وَمَا وَضَعْتُ فِي كِتَابِيَ الصَّحِيحِ حَدِيثًا إِلَّا اخْتَسَلْتُ قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ وَصَلَّيْتُ رَكْعَتَيْنِ Every hadith I put in this book, I go and take a shower and do two rak'ah of a prayers, and then I will write the hadith. This is what he says. 7,500 hadiths. Imagine how many showers and how many units of prayers he did before he writes the book. So this book is considered sacred, my friends, sacred, has no rival. When it comes in the Sunni tradition, in Egypt, they used to put this book in the home, in their homes, not, not to read it for barakah, for a blessing, just like the Quran. When you put the Quran in your bedroom, in your car, in your office for blessings, they used to put Sahih al-Bukhari for blessings. This is how they treated this book. His students are Al-Imam Muslim, Ibn Al-Hajjaj, Al-Qushayri, and Naysaburi, who wrote the second book here, Sahih Muslim, is from Naysabur. His student is Ibn Majah, Al-Qazwini. His student is uh, Al-Imam Al-Tarmadi. So most of the Huffaz and the transmitters of Hadith, they come after him, they are his students. They learn from him. Even they learn how to organize the book from Bukhari. What else about him? Now, you know something about Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail. Let's hear what Imam al-Bukhari says about Fatima alayhi salam and how she was treated. I'm not quoting any other source. I'm quoting this book. I am quoting this book, Bukhari. Let's see. Don't, don't listen to other books. Don't open other books. Only this book, Bukhari. In this book, Sahih al-Bukhari, there are two sets and two groups of hadith. One, which I am going to share with you soon. One says that the Prophet respected Fatima so much and he said, whatever hurts Fatima hurts me. Whatever offends Fatima offends me. Whatever makes Fatima angry makes me angry. In Bukhari, of course, if you go and search about this hadith, the Prophet says even more and more in the Sunni traditions, in the books of the Sunni traditions, the Prophet says more and more about Fatima. 
He says, Fatima, in Allah yarda li rida Fatima. Not me, Muhammad. God is pleased for her pleasure and her satisfaction. And he's angry, angry for her ang anger, for Fatima's anger. In Allah yarda li rida Fatima wa yaghdabu li ghadabiha. And many other hadiths that illustrates that Fatima was part of the Prophet. And the Prophet respected her a great deal and he took care of her and he said she's the master of the ladies of this life. In another hadith he says she's the master of the ladies from the beginning min al awwaleen ila al akhireen. She's the mistress of the ladies from the beginning of the universe till the end. In third hadith the Prophet says she's the mistress of the ladies of paradise. Sayyidatu Nisa'i Ahl Jannah and many 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 others. And Aisha, Lady Aisha when she was asked about Fatima, she said she was the most beloved person in this life to the heart of Prophet Muhammad This is the testimony of Lady Aisha in these books. So I'll show you the first set, what the Prophet said about Fatima. Then we go to the second set of hadiths, which are also from Bukhari, and see how Fatima was treated by the caliphs after the death of her father. Are you ready for that? Okay. Let's go to page 303. And by the way, before I go to these pages, my friends, these dis discussions that I am having with you these nights, they should affirm your faith in God, in the Prophet, and in the family of the Prophet. They should help you to find out about the truth, to discover the truth. We are searching for the truth. Our objective here is just to know the truth, that's it. To know the truth. But also, let me add this thing, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, whoever is listening, whether you are Shia, whether you are Sunni, whether you are Sufi, whether you are Christian, whatever religion you have, it doesn't matter. These discussions should not corrupt our relationships. These discussions, this discussions that we are having, they are scholarly discussions and I'm bringing evidence with me and I'm trying not to be emotional and I'm trying not to be biased, though it is very difficult. I'm trying to do my best to just show you, share with you what is written in the books that many people do not even know about it. They don't know about them. They don't read these books. They don't spend time to go and research. 99% of the Muslims do not read their own books. They don't read them. They don't know what is happening. So my goal here is to share these hadiths with you. But also it has to serve our Islamic unity. Shias and Sunnis must remain brothers and sisters and friends and work co-workers and neighbors. They should respect each other. They should defend each other. And I sincerely believe, sincerely believe that we are one family. Despite these discussions that we have, we still have to remain one family. This is, should not be a reason for division. We have to be strong. We have to pray shoulder to shoulder, to break our fast shoulder to shoulder, to communicate with each other, to respect each other. And we should not enforce anything on each other. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ God says in his book, whoever wants to believe and whoever wants to disbelieve, it's up to you. But then we will be held accountable tomorrow before God on the Day of Judgment. God is going to ask me, how did you spend your life? You were all, always busy eating, drinking, having fun, entertainment, and you didn't care? You didn't care who I asked you to follow? You didn't care? You just followed a majority of people? If we are supposed to follow the majority, then all of us, all of us, we have to be, we have to be what? Hmm? Not Christians. We have to be what? More than the Christians. Buddhist. Because Buddhist today, Buddhism is the majority. But majority does not mean that always it's right. Doesn't mean always right. God says, I want you to incorporate aql and reason. I have given you this aql. Use it. Use your brain to find out. 
So let's go to Bukhari now. Let's go to page 3 of 3 and see what the Prophet says about Fatima alayhi salam. This is page 303. Here. Bab manaqibu qarabat Rasulullah wa manqabatu Fatima alayhi salam bintu nabi This is Bukhari. This is Bukhari. The book that I have is page 303. This is page 303. The Prophet says about Fatima, Fatima Sayyidatu Nisa'i Ahli Al-Jannah. She is the mistress of the ladies of paradise. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu qal, irqabu Muhammadan fi ahli baytih. Take care of the family, of take care, respect the Prophet, honor the Prophet by respecting ah, his ahlu bayt, his family. This is Abu Bakr. The Prophet says, anil miswar ibn makhrama, al miswar ibn makhrama, one of the companions of the Prophet, anna rasulallahi qal, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima tu bad'atun minni, bad'a means part, part of me. فَمَنْ أَغْضَبَهَا أَغْضَبَنِي Whoever makes Fatima angry is making me angry. Let's go to another page in, in Sahih al-Bukhari. فَضَائِلُ أَصْحَابِ النَّبِي بَابْ مَنَاقِبُ فَاطِمَة This chapter belongs to Fatima and he narrates only one hadith about Fatima, only. And he repeats the hadith from the same narrator. المسور ابن مخرمة أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قال فاطمة بضعة مني فمن أغضبها أغضبني Whoever makes Fatima angry makes me angry Go to Muslim Muslim is 11.08 11.08 Let's see what Muslim says about Fatima This is 11.08 my friends Again Muslim says something different. فضائل الصحابة صحيح مسلم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما فاطمة بضعة مني يؤذيني ما آذاها. Different phrase. Bukhari says whatever makes Fatima angry makes me angry. Muslim says the Prophet said whatever hurts Fatima and torment Fatima torments me and hurts me. يؤذيني ما آذاها whatever and whoever hurts Fatima would hurt me now come to the Quran my friend open this book and see here those who hurt the Prophet what happens to them الذين والذين يؤذون this is chapter Surah Tawbah page 196 verse 61 Chapter 9, verse 61. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ As for those who torment the Prophet and hurt the Prophet, a humiliating punishment is reserved for them. Go to chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 57, and see what God about those who hurt the Prophet. إن الذين verily those يؤذون الله ورسوله those who hurt and affront God and His apostle لعنهم الله في الدنيا والآخرة God cursed them in this life and in the hereafter وأعد لهم عذابا مهينا and God is going to prepare a humiliating punishment for them this is the Quran those who hurt the Prophet. And then you heard earlier what Bukhari said. Whoever hurts Fatima hurts me. Okay? This is the first set of the hadith. Now come to Bukhari again and see how Fatima was treated by the political establishment from Bukhari, not from another source, from the most authentic source. And nobody questioned Bukhari. Nobody questioned him. Nobody question his authenticity. Go to page 249. 249, my friends. This is 249. The story narrated by Aisha. An Aisha. An Urwa and Aisha. That Fatima came asking for her share after the death of her father, 
She, she said, I have a share, the land of Khaybar, the land of Fadak. She came to her, to Aisha's father, which is the first caliph, Abu Bakr. فَأَبَى أَبُو بَكْرٍ أَنْ يَدْفَعَ إِلَى فَاطِمَ مِنْهَا شَيْئًا Abu Bakr refused. Aisha is saying the story in Bukhari. Abu Bakr refused to pay Fatima anything. فَوَجَدَتْ فَاطِمَةُ عَلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرٍ وَجَدَتْ وَجَدَتْ means غَضِبَتْ She became angry at Abu Bakr. فِي ذَلِكْ فَهَجَرَتْهُ She deserted him. هَجَرَ means she left him. She deserted him. She did not talk to him. فَهَجَرَتْهُ فَلَمْ تُكَلِّمْهُ حَتَّى تُوَفِّيَتْ She never talked to Abu Bakr until she died. وَعَاشَتْ بَعْدَ النَّبِيِّ سِتَّةَ أَشْهُرْ She lived after the Prophet six months. Months. فَلَمَّا تُوَفِّيَتْ دَفَنَهَا زَوْجُهَا عَلِيٌّ لَيْلًا When she died, her husband Ali buried her in the night. وَلَمْ يُؤْذَنْ بِهَا أَبَا بَكْرَ Abu Bakr was not given permission to come to the procession and the burial of the daughter of the Prophet. This is one hadith. Kitab al-Maghazi, Sahih al-Bukhari. Go to the second hadith. Second hadith, page 347. 347. This hadith was in, in 347. Let me go to 249. 249. 249. This is 249. Again, from Aisha. Anna Aisha. This is Kitab Fardul Khums. The first one was Maghazi. The wars. This one is Khums. Again, from Aisha. فَغَضِبَتْ Fatima بِنْتُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَهَجَرَتْ أَبَا بَكْرٍ Fatima got Angry, غضبت. Here he uses the term غضب. غضبت. She became angry. And remember what the Prophet said earlier. Whatever Fatima, إن الله يرضى لرضا فاطمة ويغضب لغضبها. And I get angry for her anger. Okay. فهجرت أبا بكر. She deserted him. She didn't speak to him. فلم تزل مهاجرته حتى توفيت. She kept not talking to him until she died. Until she died. وَعَاشَتْ بَعْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ سِتَّةَ أَشْهُرُ Okay. So this is the second hadith. We come to page 562. The third hadith in 562. This is 562. Which book this? كتاب الفرائض. Again, صحيح البخاري. قال فهجرته فاطمة فلم تكلمه حتى ماتت. regarding أبو بكر. the حديث regarding أبو بكر فهجرته فاطمة فلم تكلمه حتى ماتت. three different locations at least in Bukhari. let's go to Muslim. let's go to Termidi. Termidi is 1817. Termidi here in his Sunan. 1817 Termidhi says not only she did not speak to Abu Bakr she didn't speak to Umar too she was angry at Umar look at Sunan Jami'u Termidhi okay Kitab al-Seer al-Seer an Abi Huraira anna Fatima jaat Aba Bakr wa Umar radiyallahu anhuma tas'alu mirathaha min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فقال سمعنا رسول الله يقول إني لا أورث. They said to Fatima, the Prophet said, I don't leave inheritance to my family. قالت والله لا أكلمكما أبدا فماتت ولا تكلمهما. Fatima said, Fatima عليه السلام said, I'm not going to speak to you anymore. And she died, and she did not talk to them. Now, how come Abu Bakr and Umar they hear a hadith? from the Prophet regarding his own personal inheritance and his family, his daughter Fatima and his son-in-law Ali and his uncle Abbas who are the closest people to the Prophet, they are the family of the Prophet. They didn't hear that hadith. How come? Imagine yourself leaving a will regarding your inheritance and someone who's not part of the family knows about that will but your family do not know about that will. Does that happen? Does it happen anywhere? 
let me share with you what this man, Ibn Abil Hadid al Mu'tazili, one of the greatest scholars in the Sunni tradition, who was born in Madain and died in Baghdad 800 years ago, wrote in his book, Sharh Ibn Abil Hadid. 20 volumes. This is volume 20. Let's go to page. Let's go to page 21. Page 21. Let's share it with you. Wahada Aliyun, Ibn Abil Hadid says, Wahada Aliyun, Wa Fatima, Wal Abbas, Mazalu ala Kalimatin Wahida, Yukadzibuna Riwaya, Nahnu Maashir al Ambiya Lanwarith, Wayakuluna in Naha Muhtalaka. Ali, his wife Fatima, Al Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, all those three who are the family of the Prophet, they say the Prophet never said, I don't leave inheritance. Whatever I leave is going to be charity. They never. And they said this hadith that is narrated by Abu Bakr and Umar is fabrication. Listen what he says. قالوا وكيف كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يعرف هذا الحكم يعرف هذا الحكم غيرنا ويكتمه عنا ونحن الورثة. How come the Prophet tells this hadith to others while we are the inheritors? He doesn't tell us. The Prophet did not have time to call Fatima one day and say to her, Fatima, Habibti, you know, I'm not leaving anything for you. So you have to know that all my belongings are charity. He didn't have time. His WhatsApp did not work that day. He had no connection. He could not tell Fatima. Fatima was with him. Fatima's room is next to the Prophet's room in the same compound, in the same mosque. And he would see Fatima every single day. He never told Fatima, he never told Ali, he never told Al Abbas, his uncle. How come Abu Bakr and Umar they know about a hadith? And the closest people to the Prophet who live with him in the same house do not know about that hadith. How come? My friends, Ibn Abil Hadid again in his book, he says, in, in page 24, he says, Abu Bakr at the time of his death, قَالَ وَقَالَ Abu Bakr, this is Ibn Abil Hadith, Mu'tazilite, Sunni scholar, Sunni historian and jurist. قَالَ وَقَالَ Abu Bakr فِي مَرَضِهِ الَّذِي مَا تَفِيهِ In his illness where he died eventually of that illness, لَوَدَتْتُ I wish أَنِّي لَمْ أَكْشِفْ بَيْتَ فاطمة. I wish I have never desecrated and exposed the house of Fatima because there was an attack on her house after the Prophet's death and I am going to show you where is that mentioned in the Sunni references so Abu Bakr wished at time of his death that he never desecrated the house of Fatima وَلَوْ كَانَ أُغْلِقَ عَلَى حَرْبِ فَنَدَمَ وَالنَّدَمْ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا عَنْ ذنب. Ibn Abi hadith says Abu Bakr was remorseful, regretful at the time of his death because he did something gross, because he did a sin, he committed a sin. This is Ibn Abil Hadith. Illa an dhamb. This is not me. I'm just telling you what history says. Tirmidhi in 1817, Sunan al Tirmidhi, uh, Sunan ibn Majah 2486. 2486. This is Ibn Majah 2486. Sunan Ibn Majah, my friends, <clears throat> hadith number 145. Ibn Majah and Zayd ibn Arqam, the companion of the Prophet, radiallahu anhu, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li aliyan wa Fatima wal Hassan wal Hussein. The Prophet said to those four, Ana silmun liman salamtum. وَحَرْبٌ لِمَنْ حَارَبْتُمْ I'm in peace for whomever you are in peace with. And I am at war with whomever you are at war with. This is the Prophet. This is Sunan Ibn Majah al Qazwi in his book. You tell me, my friends, what do you make out of that? On the one hand, the Prophet says, the anger of Fatima, Whoever makes her angry, whoever hurts her, 
whoever torments Fatima is tormenting me and hurting me and making, making me angry. Okay? Whoever is at peace with Fatima is at peace with me. Whoever is at war with Fatima and her family is at war with me. Then you come to the second group and you find several hadiths in all these sahah, in all these books, that Fatima died while she was angry at the first caliph and second caliph. Please, you tell me, what do you make out of that? I'm not going to draw any conclusion. I want you, you to know the conclusion, yourself. Okay? Now, some people say, how could those caliphs, great men, do such things? How could Umar attack the house of Fatima? Again, let's go to this source. Don't go to any other source. Go to Sahih al-Bukhari. And find out how Umar was treating women. All men, all, all society, but especially women. How he treated women. Let's see how he treated other women. Before we come to his own women. Let's go to page 300. Page 300, Sahih al-Bukhari. This is 304. This is 300. Group of women were sitting with the Prophet asking him questions. Omar comes, they were terrified. When they were terrified and they put on the hijab, meaning that they were sitting in front of the Prophet and the Prophet did not ask them to put on hijab. But when Omar comes, they are terrified of Omar, not of the Prophet of Omar. So Omar says to them, why are you terrified? They said to him, listen, they said to him, Naam, anta afadhu wa aghladhu min rasulillah. You are more vicious and more cruel than the Prophet. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. This is Kitab Fadailu Ashab al-Nabi. And Bukhari considered this a virtue for Umar, a virtue, fadila, manqaba. This is a plus for him. This is a credit because he's more cruel, more harsh, more rough, more vicious with women than the Prophet. So this is about other women. Let's come to his own wife. See how the second caliph treated his wife. Go to page 449. Page 449. In Sahih al-Bukhari, 443-449, Omar says, long story, Hadith, Babu Maw'idatul Rajul Ibnatahu Lihali Zawjiha. Those of you who are researchers, you have to read, you have to put down and document the name of the chapter because pages are different. You may not find this specific book, this specific version. You may not find it. So if you want to search, put the name of the Bab, the chapter. You will find it easy. So here, Omar is saying, we used to be harsh with our women when we were in Mecca. When we came to Medina, we find that the women of the Ansar, they hit back. They answer their husbands. They are not, not too afraid of their husbands. So he says, my wife learned this from the women of Ansar. He says, فَصَخَبْتُ عَلَى مْرَأَتِي Omar is saying, فَصَخَبْتُ صَخَبْتُ means, I yelled, I screamed. There was an uproar, صَخَب. I screamed at my wife. At my wife. فَرَاجَعَتْنِي She hits back. She screams back at me. فَأَنْكَرْتُ أَنْ تُرَاجَعَنِي I was shocked. What happened to my wife? Usually she takes it with pride and a smile. I scream at her and she succumb she surrenders this time she's answering me she's screaming back so i said to her she said i learned this from the wife of the prophet and i learned that from hafsa the rest of the story is long go and check it out omar says i found out that my daughter hafsa she screams back at the prophet and there are many other stories. The time is now almost 40 minutes. I don't know how does time flies. I'm so sorry because I have prepared 
many examples from this book of how Omar was violent. This is in his nature. So yes, sure. Did he attack the house of Fatima? At least Tabari says, at least Tabari, this is the most credible Sunni history, the most credible Sunni history. He says he threatened Fatima. فَوَجَدَ عُمَرْ أَتَى عُمَرُ بْنُ الْخَطَّابِ This is Tabari. خَبَرُ الْبَيْعَ لِأَبِي بَكْرِ Under the chapter of how people paid allegiance to Abu Bakr. قَالَ أَتَى عُمَرُ بْنُ الْخَطَّابِ مَنْزِلَ عَلِيٍّ وَفِيهِ طَلْحَةٌ وَالزُّبَيْرُ وَرِجَالٌ مِّنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ فَقَالَ وَاللَّهِ لَأُحَرِّقَنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ I'll burn down this house, the house of Fatima. I'll burn it down upon you. If you don't come and pay allegiance to Abu Bakr. So yes, it happens, my friends. And I'm going to show you tomorrow how... Omar sometimes in the mosque, he would pelt, he would throw stones at people in the mosque of the Prophet. And how some Sahaba, companions of the Prophet, they wanted the Prophet to come out. They went and they pelted the door of the Prophet. Can you imagine? Pelting with the stones, with pebbles, not knocking at the door. This is in Bukhari. This is in Muslim here. In Muslim. This is in Muslim. This is in Sahih, Muslim here. How they pelted the door of the 801. Before I go, I have to show you this because this is important. This is important. فَرَفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَهُمْ وَحَصَبُوا الْبَابِ This is Salatul Musafirin. This is Sahih, Muslim. وَحَصَبُوا الْبَابِ حَصَبُوا means they pelted the door of the Prophet with pebbles. فَلَمَّا خَرَجَ إِلَيْهِمْ, رسول... فخرج إليهم رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُغْضَبًا the Prophet came out of his room angry at them. It happens, my friends, yes. It wasn't always milk and honey, no. When you investigate the history, you will be shocked. You'll find out that the Prophet was mistreated. Ali ibn Abi Talib was mistreated. Fatima al-Zahra was mistreated. The great companions of the Prophet were mistreated by some. And we will continue these investigations with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.